The perception of Africa in the global media, especially in the Western world, has been a subject, a long subject of contention. Reports indicate that Africa loses, guess what, a staggering $4.2 billion annually due to negative media coverage by Western outlets. Now, this media portrayal often focuses on conflict, poverty, disease, and corruption, overshadowing the continent's immense potential and achievements. Now, as a result, foreign investment, tourism, and global partnership, partnerships suffer further, deepening economic challenges. Now, given this impact, the need for more homegrown African media platforms has become critical. Uh, these platforms uh, would not only offer a more balanced and accurate narrative, but also help reshape Africa's image on the global stage. And today we'll be discussing how negative media coverage by Western outlets affects Africa economically and explore the potential of local media in countering this damaging narrative. And joining us is Claudine Moore, of course, she's been, she's been exposed, but <laughs> the managing director of Alison Africa, which recently released its inaugural Africa Business Cultural Intelligence Report. Claudine, welcome to Just Siri. Thank okay. you. Thank you, beautiful ladies, for having me here today. It's great to see you all. Thank she you. She has welcome. been in the back end. <laughs> She's been with us and listening to all the behind the scenes yeah, conversations. Behind the scenes gist, yeah. <laughs> welcome. Thank you so much, Claudine. Thank you. Um, so let's start. You know, as Cap uh, so Kathleen and Catherine, uh -oh. the, my two yeah. bilingual cats. <laughs> Kat said in her intro, we know that Western media portrayal often focuses on conflict, poverty, disease, war, famine corruption, whatever it may be, when it comes to anything having to do with the continent. Mm -hmm. What are the most common misconceptions uh, or biases that you have seen Western media perpetuate when it comes to Africa? And I think the addendum to that is in the 21st century, in 2024, why do these narratives persist? Yeah. I think we'll start with why do these narratives persist? And I think, quite frankly, to speak very candidly, the, the reasons range from uh, laziness, laziness in finding out contemporary and up-to-date data and the information, and also on the other end of that expect spectrum, a bit more extreme, but to be quite frank, is racism. Anything black or African is negative. Mm -hmm. So I think we are operating between those, uh, the spectrum of those two possibilities. Um, and I think when you're looking at Western media, I think in this report that, and first of all, this report that you're citing is from... Um, the Africa No Filter team, headed okay. by Moki Makura. So kudos for her and her team for pulling that together. But there's a, a, a sentiment in that report that outlines that the word violence is used more when, it's, when, when um, discussing African elections than any other elections in any part of the world, including elections in other parts of the world. Well, we almost equally saw violent. a coup on January the 6th. Exactly, and they exactly. Call it a coup. Yeah. And they refused to call it a coup, mm -hmm. exactly. I recently, um, so I'm the junk professor, and one of the things I do is that I talk about you know sort of business in African markets and recently I was talking to um, a university in Florida and um, somebody asked the question and they said oh um, they referred to African governments as regimes and I said the word regime why do we not say this what does that mean mm -hmm. the word regime is always used for military, military. military and it's used for also dictatorships. dictatorships but it's specifically used for African governments they mm. use the word regime but, but then we have we have a Biden regime, a potential Trump regime, mm -hmm. a, a Harris regime. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's also the words. Words are very powerful and should be yeah. used. Uh, um, you know, very Claudine, carefully. Uh, let me piggyback off um, to Lou's question yeah. because grow, you know, years back, one of the things you will see on Western media, you will see starving African children, right. yeah. stark yeah. reality. You know, you'll be mm -hmm. wondering that. Ha, where did that just come from? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he moved into that disgusting one. They show touched. Um, mud houses, mm -hmm. touch roof. In fact, you see some disparaging things said, like, "Oh, Africa is a is a is a country." You know right. those kinds of things. I know that there's been extremes in the past. Mm -hmm. Would you say that in recent times, or let's say pushing into the 21st century, has there been any kind of shift? Because every time when I used to go abroad, I used to think, "Okay." Oh, is this for raising funds? Yeah. So why have we seen the extreme of what is not even commonplace, yeah, 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 would you yeah. say there's been any kind of shift at all? I think there has been a shift and there continues to be a shift, but there's still a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, I think well, certainly when, you know, growing up in the UK, you're absolutely right. You'd see every, and even now when I go home, mm -hmm. when I go to England um, and I see at Christmas time, there's all these, you know, images of yes. like children starving and, you know, <laughs> come and save us, come and yes, save come us and save sort us. of narrative. 
Meanwhile, I've lived in Nigeria before. I lived here for two years. I had a better life living here in, when, when I lived here for the time I was here than e in some aspects than I did living in America. So what I'm trying to say is there's not a balance. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. Those pictures are not lies mm -hmm. because those pictures come from somewhere. Yes. So they, the reality yeah. does exist. But the issue is there's no balance. And without that balance, and, and that imbalance, I should say, is what causes these negative stereotypes. And it continues and it continues. So, you know, um, I remember, you know, when I've, I've, been, I've been to Nigeria at this point about 40 times in the last mm. decade. I come here all the time. And I remember showing pictures to, to friends and they're like, I don't see any animals. I don't see any giraffes. Oh, I don't see. Yeah. And I'm like, this is, this is, this oh, is Lagos. You're not this is an urban center. <laughs> yeah, and, and the thing is, it sounds comical to us. Yeah. But the reality is, that's all that people it's see. So, but and let me just... It like is changing, push, though. It um, is changing. Yeah. Slowly, I'm wondering that slowly. for us to see this change happen, where does the onus lie, really? Is it us that needs to change our narrative or how they perceive us? Well, I love your tagline, Africa first, mm. right? Your tagline, Africa first, squarely puts Africa and Africans in the center of the story. Absolutely. Mm. And that's how it has been, you know, centuries ago. But with the world, the way the world has changed, it's always us in someone else's story mm -hmm. rather than us at the center of the story. So I think we have to take responsibility for even what we all share ourselves on social media. We all have different um, uh, echo chambers, different yeah. people yeah. following us. Yeah. Um, whenever I'm in any country in the continent and when I'm here in Nigeria, I'm always very specific about what I show. Not because I want to show only the good stuff, but because there's enough bad stuff. Mm. Yeah. Let's show some, some, some good um, images and some, and some good perceptions. Um, but it is changing, which is positive, because, and I think with the rise of Afrobeats, the sort of the rise of international um, African leaders and actors, and just across the gamut, whether it's politics or whether it's entertainment, and people are seeing as more relatable. Mm. I think a lot of it, sometimes people look at um, Africa as this mysterious place. The other. Yeah, this oh, other, no. exactly, other. other it. And mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know... Who is mysterious depends on where you're sitting. Yeah. All right. yeah. You're, you're mysterious to us. We're not exactly. mysterious to ourselves. Yeah. I, I have a question, but I'm going to go off book now before I, I ask you the question I want to ask you, which has to do with numbers. What's your, your first genuine impression about Nigeria? Um, I came to Nigeria. I love that question. Thank you. My first trip to Nigeria was in 2011. Um, the Nigerian Institute of Public Relations invited me to be um, a keynote speaker at their annual conference. And I was petrified because I'd never done a keynote speech at that time. Okay. Um, so, and, but I was excited. I was excited about coming because, and my experience is a bit unique, I think, to other people. My mm. background, I was born and raised in the UK, but my parentage is Caribbean. But I was brought up by Pan-Africanist parents who okay. believed and said and taught me and my sisters that you're black therefore you're African first mm. so you're African and you're African first you've got Caribbean parentage and yeah. you're born in the UK yeah. so I always grew up knowing that I was an African woman I mean you see all five of us here mm. we're all African women yes. right we're all black African women then um, I always knew that what I was seeing on the news was skewed mm. what I was seeing on media was skewed I always knew that but it was in 2010 when I first went to Ghana my first trip to sub-Saharan Africa, and I saw how skewed the media was. Because I was like, this is a cra. This is nothing like what I'm seeing compared. Yeah. compared to what I'm seeing. So the next year, I then came to Nigeria. So I already knew what you're seeing in the news, Claudine, already know is you, you experienced Ghana a yeah. few months ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Already know it's going to be skewed. And when I came here, I was excited by the vibrancy of Lagos. I was excited by, you know, when I, I've worked in many different countries, and you do not get smarter, brighter, more resilient people than Nigerians. Like the oh, smartest please. people. I'm, I'm, not just, I'm not just saying that because I'm sitting there. I'm you. not just saying that because I'm surrounded by Nigerians. I'm yeah. saying it because it's true. Like the, just, just smart, just resilient, innovative. And yes, there are lots of problems that Absolutely. prevent many people from really flourishing in the way that they sure. want to and should be able to. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't stop talent. And, and raw talent existing, oh, especially to exist in the environment, which is a hard, a hard one. Oh, God. All right. So and I'm not saying that just because I'm, I'm in Nigeria that. now. I, I'm, yeah, actually, no, I, I have to go back to my question because the next question that wants to fall, hey, if, if I could mm, just share that question with you. Ah, but <laughs> let's, keep, um, let's keep this train moving. So one of the statistics that I found interesting 
and we talked about before we came on was the fact that 4.2 billion dollars is lost yeah. annually you see um, yeah. from negative portrayal of, of Africa by the Western media. Yeah. How does that make sense? When you say 4.2, yeah. how can you break it down for us? Yeah. Some form? So um, how, how the authors of the report got to that specific data point, I don't know because I'm not the author of the report, but I can tell you anecdotally how that plays out mm. in the business world. So you have, let's take you're someone in New York, Mr. CEO in New York, he's watching C, you know, CNN or an international news channel in the morning and he's seeing... Africa, he's seeing coups, he's seeing violence, he's seeing corruption, and that's what he sees in the news in the morning. He then opens up his newspaper, mm -hmm. and he opens up his newspaper and he reads about more corruption, more coups, more famine, more etc. Mm -hmm. And then he listens to a podcast, and they're talking about the same thing. So what I'm explaining here is that he's seeing constant mm -hmm. negative portrayal. And then he gets an email, and the email is from, hi, I have an opportunity for you in Nigeria. And what he's seen about Nigeria for the entire morning, just using this as an example, mm -hmm. has been negative courage, um, ne negative coverage. He's a human being. Yeah. So he's obviously going to create, going to um, have a negative perception. Yeah. And then when he gets that email seeking investment, he's like, I've just seen on the media yeah. on the way to the office that, chaos that there's chaos yeah. there. Why am I going to invest in your startup? Yeah. Now, the reason I mentioned at the beginning that these negative perceptions stem from laziness to racism, in that CEO's I instance, it could be laziness because to go further, ignorance to go yeah. further yeah. and yeah. say, even though I saw what I saw in the news today, let me, let me get some someone on my team to do some research mm. because this startup looks interesting mm. and maybe there's more to the story. But it, I mean, is it on them? Because I mean, we can say that for investors, yeah. but the ordinary Westerner would not, should not be burdened with that responsibility of, oh, I heard this about Nigeria, but I don't want to believe that this is what it is. So let me go and dig deeper. Should it be on them? No, you're right. And that's a brilliant point. It shouldn't be on them, but it's, there's multiple ways of approaching this. So uh, people have to be naturally curious mm -hmm. and they are naturally curious. When you go to school, if you're in a multicultural environment and your friend at school is Nigerian or your friend at school is from another country, you're inclined to want to know more. With the rise of Afrobeats, for example, that's the biggest you know, cultural export that yeah. Nigeria um, has in terms of wide, widespread sharing of your music and that creates curiosity about your culture. Mm -hmm. And there's lots of cultural elements. I love the fact that with Afro, with Afro beats and Nigerian music, it's the, you're, you're speaking in your native language. Mm. If other people understand, they do. If they don't, they don't. It's their business. But mm. everybody loves it regardless. Yeah. So, um, but then you have to think that people have their everyday lives and they have to, information has to be easily fed to them. So then I think what that means is that when you have your own echo chambers, you have your own, we all have, um, media has been democratized. We all have, Instagram accounts, we have accounts on X, uh, on Facebook, etc. Mm -hmm. um, we have friends around the world. It's up to us as well to share what we know. Yeah. Um, and then people would be more curious to know more. So, I mean, it's it's a mixture of both. The media does have um, have a part to play, though, for sure. Okay, so still talking about a skewed perception um, about the report, right? Unlike most reports on Africa, I find it quite in interesting that this particular report does not focus on the traditional big five yeah. African economies, right? It goes beyond to provide a nu nuanced overview of the continent, like representing West, East, mm -hmm. South, as well as North and Central Africa. So you have Kenya, you have... Um, Nigeria, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Morocco, South Africa. But what's happening in, um, say, DR Congo and mm. Morocco that landed them in that report? Right. So at Allison, we decided to create what we called the, and it was our inaugural, Africa Business Cultural Insights Report. And to your point, we decided, um, and as an agency, I will say, our tagline, and it's true as an agency, at Allison, we do things differently. So we decided how that would manifest in the report is to focus on all regions, North, South, East and West. And when we were thinking about which countries in North and Central Africa to focus on, we chose DRC because DRC is the largest country in Sub-Saharan Africa just by land mass. Mm -hmm. It has one of the fastest growing um, uh, populations in the world. Um, it also has a massive amount of natural resources, That's but the country place. is mirrored mm. in a humanitarian crisis Absolutely. at the moment. Mm, yeah. And it's that juxtaposition where we wanted to highlight that because, of course, where there's opportunity, people are going to run. Yeah. But we put in our, in our, in Alison's report, we, we, we wrote that 
if organize, you know, business is business, right? But if you're an organization that wants to go to a country like DRC, take a step and think about your corporate social responsibility, responsibility. considering what is happening in that country. Mm -hmm. So that's why we chose DRC. With Morocco, um, Morocco is listed um, as one of the most easiest and favorable countries um, on, the, the, on their list of uh, ease of doing, doing business. business. Morocco um, ranks very high, and it's actually one of the highest in, in Africa. Um, so that was one of the reasons. They also are building lots of stadiums at the moment because there are going to be lots of tournaments taking yeah, place yeah. in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, there's lots of infrastructure um, investment taking place in the country. All right. Because you know, now that we're talking business in Africa, maybe mm -hmm. we should now, you know, target it a little more further. Uh, Africa's diverse business landscape is basically always expanding and evolving. Uh, and very competitive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think Nigerians are particularly more competitive. But many still see Africa as a country. You know, many of them do not have that overview of 54 different continents, spread, countries spread across different landmass and everything. And the diversity of these people is there. We have cultural diverse, yeah. language, so many things divide us. So what are the changes that uh, we're, witnesses across, we're witnessing across the business landscape in Africa itself? Um, and, and isn't it just bizarre when people think like Africa is a country? It's just it's just so biz it's so bizarre. Um, and again, to your point, it's just I I do it, it bothers me because I just think it's just laziness to think that this mass this mass is just a country. It's mm. just bizarre. Um, but some of the changes that are happening um, is women. Uh, there are more women entrepreneurs um, in Africa um, across the continent and in specific African countries than in any other part of the world. Um, there are massive amount of a massive sway of tech innovation across yeah. the continent, and in particular fintech, um, and also in particular tech that's reaching those at the last mile. Um, and I think that's really important because you know you have your urban centres, um, you have your cities, which is great, but this technology can and should really um, seek to uplift and um, improve the lives of those at the last mile as well. The, the technology exists; it's just getting it to them, and that's some of the changes that we're seeing. And right. I think this is a conversation about leaving no one behind as well. Right. Uh, at the end of the day, they will come to us. Uh, we know what's going on on the continent as well. So as Lolo said, we're talking about 54 countries, 1.37 mm -hmm. billion people. But the issue is that our story has always been told in a one-dimensional manner. And I've really been stuck on the fact that we lose 4.2 mm -hmm. billion because of media bias. It's what it is. It, it, and, and the thing about that is that this is where the work that we do um, in public relations and communications is so important because you have organizations that are seeking partnerships, mm -hmm. seeking um, investment, um, et cetera. But the example I gave you earlier of Mr. CEO going yeah. to work, yeah. if that Mr. CEO on the way to work, he also opened up a publication and saw an article about some of the incredible um, innovations in technology in Nigeria, he would have had in that morning two stories. Yeah. He would have seen the story about, uh, you know, corruption, uh, you know, it happening over an election, but he's also see a story about investment opportunities, um, innovation, etc. And that's where PR and communications is the is is part of the answer to changing the narrative. To changing yeah. the narrative. Mm. And I think that's something that more um, African governments and organizations need to take really quite seriously because your 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 organizations here that do take their pr and communications very seriously you can see how that plays out in how they're perceived globally yeah. absolutely yeah okay so i want to get us to um the women entrepreneurship because that's a big conversation mm -hmm. but also remember that africa has the youngest population in the world with more than 400 million young people who are between the ages of 15 to 35. The truth of the matter is the world can no longer ignore us. They're going to come, yeah. but we need to make sure they come on yeah. our terms. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to take Catherine's question now <laughs> because of time, because I also want to um, make sure we touch on the yeah. media platforms, the homegrown mm -hmm. platforms, mm -hmm. and their role in all of this. But according to the World Economic Forum, women make up 58% of Africa's mm -hmm. self-employed population, contributing around 13% of Africa's total GDP. And African women are rising in entrepreneurship and leadership, and the continent is witness witnessing a robust transformation which is also being driven by its women, with Sub-Saharan Africa having the world's highest rates of women involved in entrepreneurial activity. Now, across the countries you looked at, that is Kenya, Nigeria, DR Congo, Morocco, and South Africa, what would you say were the commonalities and sort of the situations that women entrepreneurs find themselves in in these countries? I think some of the commonalities include um, being 
being forced by necessity and need, um, not being able to rely solely on one income yeah. um, for the household. And I think that's something that we're seeing all over all over the continent, but also all over the world. Like, the, you know, this notion previously of a single income for a household, that's becoming increasingly a thing of the past for many, many markets. So it's really um, a need. Um, and also, I think what I'd like to touch on with reference to that question is that more needs to be done to support these women. Yes. Um, while, uh, you know, more needs to be done. Whilst there is a lot being done, more needs to be done. So access to finance. Yeah. Women are still seen as a much riskier um, investment, investment mm. than their, their male counterparts. Which isn't true because if you dig deep, you know, if you if you look at women and men, we we're the ones who are budget best when it comes yeah, to money. Let's let's just be honest. <laughs> we're, so, we're actually yeah. a better return on investment. Exactly, than, exactly. Than, but yeah. again, perception. Yeah. So we're a perceived um, riskier investment, and also there needs to be more mentorship programs and incubator programs mm. for women. At Allison, we have two programs. We have an internal women's leadership program for to increase leadership within the organization of women, and externally we have the Futurist Female Mentorship Program, which is um, Africa's first and only PR and mentorship program dedicated to African female tech founders. We've been doing it for five years. Oh, wow. um, and we have had Salesforce and Google as partners. Yeah. Next next week, we'll be releasing the um, winners of, of this this year's fifth edition. And they come from across the continent. Mm -hmm. And they they have brilliant, brilliant, brilliant um, uh, tech startups and brilliant founders. All they want is an opportunity. Oh. Opportunities, yeah, and, uh, yes, you know, I, I'm just enjoying um, the, 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 the possibilities that you paint in such glowing pictures. Mm -hmm. You know, let's look at the media landscape generally now. Mm -hmm. uh, there is an African proverb, I really like it. Mm -hmm. It says, Until the lion tells the story, the hunter would always be the hero. Mm -hmm. And famed author Chino Achebe said, If you don't like someone's story, then it's time that you write your role. Yeah, uh, for too long, our stories have been told by the West. They, they are the ones telling our own stories to us. We're not the, we're made villains in our own mm -hmm. story. And the narratives have been skewed in favor of how the West view us. Yeah. And now that we know that the lenses are clouded, it's time to take your glasses up and clean it a little bit. Mm -hmm. What does the report tell us about homegrown media that can challenge the Western narrative, you know, and tell our stories as they are? because we're multifaceted, yes. we're complex, authentic, and most importantly, truly, the ones that are truly reflective of who we truly are mm -hmm. and where we're headed as a people. Yeah, and that's why I was so excited when you guys invited me today, because you're an example of the change that needs to be seen. Yeah. Did you um, hear that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you know, another thing you said was your tagline here is Africa that's first. Right, absolutely putting yourself at the center of the story. So one of the things that you're seeing is more and more, um, and, and as a PR agency, we actually work, as, as obvious, we work with media across the continent. We find the most, uh, the best results that we get is when we, when we work with local networks, local mm -hmm. platforms, because your audience is coming to you for authenticity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your audience is, kind of, whilst I know that misinformation um, is an issue generally around the world, um, they also, there's, there's increasing lack of trust of global media because of yes. the reasons mentioned yes. in the other yes. report. Yes. So they're looking to you to tell the truth mm. and they're looking to you to be authentic. And I think that's the power. Western um, and global media outlets, they have um, in recent years had local people being the, the heads of bureaus, yeah. but that needs to still, there's a long way for that to go. Um, so for example, take TechCrunch, for example, Previously, the um, Africa Bureau Chief of TechCrunch was um, Ameri an American. And I know him personally, and he hadn't actually come to America, to come to any African continent that much. Now, the person who's the Bureau Chief um, and leads that is Tej, and he's here in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So he's on the ground. He's seeing the tech stories that are mm -hmm. taking place. So he knows. And I think there needs to be more of that. You take a platform like the BBC. They knew they had to have BBC Swahili, yes. BBC mm. Pigeon. And it does way better than their BBC mate, the English. BBC yeah. English. Mm -hmm. um, when you're looking, when we're working on local initiatives at the agency, um, so one of our clients, for example, is Bloomberg Philanthropies, and they do a lot of work on the ground. Um, uh, and we, they want their, their, they want their audience that is being directly impacted by their initiatives to be the one to hear and learn about them. Mm. And who do you go to? You'd come to a, a network like yourself or another local network. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, what makes Africa 
and all 54 countries across the continent, so brilliant of its people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I'm working with like creatives um, and I'm doing like a presentation or, I'm, or, or anything like that, I always say to them, we're doing an Africa presentation, I always say to them, no sunsets and no animals. <laughs> because the first thing they're going to do in, in creating you. Yeah. 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 Exactly, yeah. this beautiful so you see the elephant on the sky. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but I always tell them, no sunsets, no animals, because <laughs> you're taking away the culture. Yes. You're taking away the people. And mm -hmm. it's the people that make this continent. Yes. Mm. So um, I think that um, whenever there's an uh, initiative that's impacting people, you need to go what the people are looking at first as being authentic, and that is local news media. Yeah. So, and uh, I, yeah. I really love this conversation about the African media landscape. Yeah. Um, I was in the room when Africa First was created yeah. as a tagline for mm -hmm. New Central. Great. And the thing was, we, as you said, we want to prioritize our stories. We want to center ourselves in the story. So the perspective is ours, the narrative is ours, the voice is ours, uh, and using all of that. So I want to ask, because I saw some interesting things in the reports about media consumption, changing mm -hmm. audience demographics, the rise of digital platforms and social mm -hmm. media, as well as the diverse media landscape and global exposure in relation to the mm -hmm. continent. If you can quickly mm -hmm. do that, because we have one more, one more question, <laughs> but because sure. of time. Yeah, no, so sure. how do those all play together? In, so, in, when, so when the research team, Alison, has putting together this report, um, we what we found was that the media consumption um, across the continent and in the markets that we chose, so again, the markets that we focused on were Morocco, Kenya, Nigeria, DRC, and South Africa. Mm -hmm. It really did reflect the shift that's happening globally. Okay. People are getting more and more of their news from social media. Mm -hmm. um, people are looking more and more to digital platforms for their news and less the traditional you know, uh, yeah, platforms, media. media. But what's interesting here um, um, in Nigeria and across the continent is the um, widespread use of smartphones. Yeah. So there's still a market here um, for smartphones. There's a massive growth opportunity there, but also in terms of populations being connected. I think across the continent, oh. we're still only like 48% digitally connected across oh. the continent. Yeah. So that means there's plus 50% more yeah, people not. to get online, yeah. which, is which is the opportunity, yeah. 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 which is opportunity. Yeah. And the risk there with along the opportunity is that then you're going to get all these people across the continent who are now going to be bombarded with content from other parts of the world. Mm. So you want them to always look at, you know, have confidence in ourselves as black African people to know that, yes, you're going to see all these great things around the world, but understand yeah. that what you have here is equally as good. It's just different. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay, final, final, let's go. Uh, yeah. Final question. I mean, it's been an incredible conversation Thank so you. far. That's what happens on this table, guys. There's <laughs> always incredible conversation. And we can go on and on. But time, we're running yes. out of time. So quickly, let me see if I can wrap this up with mm -hmm. a pretty bow on top. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me ask you, um, what, do you, what would you say to those looking to invest in Africa? Yeah. And what can they take away from the insights on this report? Um, I loved, around your studio, you have lots of, amazing taglines yes we and do. i saw one as i came as i was walking through that said shock everyone and make it happen yes, yes. Mm. and i literally just saw that so i would say shock everyone and make, make it, happen. it happen i mean um there will i'll take, take myself as an example so uh as i mentioned before i was born in the uk my parentage is caribbean but you know i've always been brought up to be known myself as an african person mm -hmm. and that seed for me planted an interest in doing work across this continent and i just decided to come into nigeria in 2011 i came i saw what i saw i built relationships here and i built a business here mm -hmm. a pr agency that i had for many many years over a decade before the, my agency was acquired by allison to expand allison into african markets so i would say if you have the desire to do business here do it Mm -hmm. shock yourself shock others and just do it because there are opportunities here i'm not saying it's going to be easy yeah. beneath yeah. these braids i have lots of gray hair <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so i'm not saying it's going to be easy but god never told us anything would be easy yes. you do it anyway absolutely yeah. interesting <laughs> oh what a fantastic time we're, we've had on the show want to say a very big thank you claudine thank you for having oh, me managers. this has been great thank yeah. you so much. <laughs>